Greetings, welcome back to Black Bear News, where we are discussing climate change, abrupt climate change, and things adjacent. Uh, thank you, as always, for your discussion and commentary. Um, I knew that <clears throat> what I was talking about yesterday was going to be, uh, obviously, stir up a lot of controversy. Um I'm going, to talk, I'm going to talk just a little bit more about it today. But first, <clears throat> so uh, I, I very rarely go check my P.O. box these days. I, it's, um, I check it maybe like once a month and sometimes not even that often. But anyways, I went to the P.O. box the other day and uh, had a bunch of mail in there. And I had a bunch of uh, donations uh, via the U.S. Post. So thank you guys, um, all of you who sent me donations uh, to my PO box. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. You know who you are. Um, I also have to say, I apologize. The other day I said that Bernie Sanders was the only candidate who said <clears throat> that climate change was the most important thing. I was totally wrong. Uh, I forgot about Jay Inslee, <clears throat> the Washington governor who, um, uh, is also running on a climate change centric platform. And I also forgot our very own Owl Nation Legal, who is running a climate change centric uh, presidential cam campaign. And you can find his campaign at Mead, M E A D 2020.org, if you would like to go check it out. Um, he has a like a video thing, uh, you know video describing what's what his campaign is about etc so i'm going to link that in the description box if you guys want to go check that out uh support uh craig mead 2020 <clears throat> uh for his presidential bid i think we need <clears throat> i think we need more radical voices obviously the more radical voices we have on the left, the farther left we have <clears throat> of ideas and platforms, the more we can push the center or the center right or wherever it is we, <clears throat> wherever it is the U.S. occupies in the political spectrum, mainly center right, um, drifting more right. Uh, although we're getting now, it's, things are starting to kind of, kind of lean to the left. <clears throat> um, so, and that's a good thing. That's a great thing. Uh, the things that people were like, you know, the things that Bar Bernie Sanders was talking about in 2016 that everybody was like, oh, my God, it's pie in the sky. It's too much. It's radical. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now those things are quite widely talked about and disseminated, those ideas. And not only are they quite widely talked about, um, they are ba have basically become – uh, the dominant uh, platform ideas of all the Democratic candidates. So that's how powerful just talking about, just bringing up these ideas can be. Because people hear them and they go, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And that's why they silenced Bernie Sanders so hard in 2016, because he was saying things that every every time he was on a debate stage, his his ratings went boom. He was speaking to thousands tens and 20,000 people stadiums all over the country. Cause people were like, we love this. And then what happened with the other night when he was on Fox news, every single, you know, the whole audience was like, yay, drowning out the interviewers because they were trying to like, can you guys keep down your enthusiasm? <clears throat> uh, you know, don't let these ideas get out of the box and get into main, you know, get onto mainstream, uh, out into the mainstream because people are going to go, oh, what? That's makes perfect sense. Sounds good to me. That's what we want. Come on. And meanwhile, the Democrats and the Republicans, the Democrat establishment is going, zip it, guys. How do we squash this? How do we, how do we make this go away? Because our donors are not happy about this. <clears throat> Old sellout 
uh, D- Democrat and Republicans, uh, corrupt to the teeth, corrupt to the core, um, the politicians, the gangsters that run our country. Um, so I did want to talk. So here's the main thing that I missed. Uh, that the biggest red flag of the Corey Morningstar interview uh, yesterday. I don't know if y'all listened to that. It's pretty long. Um, here was my here in here was my biggest red flag. She said at some point it was like an hour into the interview. She said all the all the countries were, are meeting the Paris climate goals, and the U.S. is on pace or was on pace to meet its climate goals. And these people want more. These people meaning the agenda people, the globalists, the the green globalists, the green goblin globalists. And when I heard that, I was like, really? Really? We're meeting our goals? Who, Who has anybody in this audience, has anybody heard that anywhere else? Has anybody heard we're meeting our goals? We're meeting those goals. And that right there, I, she talked a really good game through the whole thing, and there were a lot of points that I agreed with her on. But that right there is means uh, I don't know who she's working for, but she's definitely working for somebody because that is utter and complete bullshit. And you know that's bullshit. And anybody who's like, Corey Morningstar, if you can find me a reason to defend that bullshit, Please bring it. But hey, I got something for you right here. Here's here's a study. <laughs> here's an article based on some data. This is from last year, October 11th, 2018. Few countries, few countries are meeting the Paris climate goals. Here are the ones that are. So every everybody knows that we're not meeting our Paris climate goals. Like everybody knows that. We're not, I mean, that's the whole problem. That's the whole issue that everybody has with the Paris Climate Agreements is that there, it's not, it's A, super, super weak. And B, there's no enforcement. It's all like, yeah, sure, we'll do it. And B, and C, we're not, nobody's close. <laughs> so I, where does Corey Morningstar get the, this data? Where does she get this? And why is she saying this? in the middle of an interview that sounds so logical and so like, so, you know, hey, conspiracy theories sound great on the left as well as on the right. That's all I got to say about that. And, you know, I believe in conspiracy theories that are based on evidence that are true. And also conspiracy theories that are based on nothing or bullshit or people saying just random shit that doesn't make any sense. Those are actual conspiracy theories that are bullshit. Again, I'm going to call, call bullshit on Corey Morningstar one more time. Uh, this week, a top scientific body studying climate change released a terrifying report. The world has just a decade to take unprecedented action to cut carbon emissions and hold global warming to a moderate but still dangerous and, still dangerous and disruptive level. That would require a rapid and far-reaching transformation of the world's economy, one of such scale and man- magnitude that it has no historical equivalent. Um, I have... I have not been timing this video, and I have so much to talk about that I, I probably won't, won't read this whole thing because I have a lot of other stuff to cover. Uh, let's see. Under the, under the agreement, 195 countries pledged to cut their greenhouse gas emissions to try to keep global warming under 2 degrees Celsius. But it's hard to imagine that will happen, as almost no country is doing a good job meeting the relatively modest goals in place. The United States, well, you know, you know about the United States. Um, So I'm just going to move to this graph here. They, they, they talk, you know, they talk about the, um, there are bright spots, but I'm going to look at this graph. So the countries. Uh, that are compatible with the 1.5C Paris Agreement to Morocco and Gambia, or the Gambia, they they say it here, 
um, anybody there, there's also a, a, a section of the graph called role model, meaning, um, you know, doing great. Nobody, <laughs> nobody. Okay. Two point C compatible. So just a little under the 1.5 C compatible. There are five countries, Bhutan, Costa Rica, Ethiopia, India, and Philippines. So India, that's quite interesting that they're doing, they're at least doing better than most. And that's a large country. Uh, in Philippines also, I, I, I don't know. Um, maybe they're just, I, I don't think the Philippines are as, as a developed, as much of a developed country as others. Maybe I'm wrong. Costa Rica, small. They can do that. Bhutan, small. Ethiopia, smaller. Insufficient. 3C, Australia, Brazil, EU, Kazakhstan, Mexico, New Zealand, Norway, Peru, Switzerland, and the United Arab Emirates. Highly insufficient. 4C, Argentina, Canada, Chile, China, Indonesia, Japan, Singapore, South Africa, South Korea. Critically insufficient. Guess who? Russia, <laughs> Saudi Arabia, Turkey, the USA, USA, and the Ukraine. So that's most of the world is, is in the insufficient So I I don't know if you have any other um, evidence to back this up, Corey Morningstar or people that are, you know follow her, please bring it on. Uh, so okay, and to piggyback this, so Prudhomme sent me a video, so interesting video on the Extinction Rebellion YouTube page. They're having a debate in the House of Commons about taking on. Like seriously considering going net zero by 2025 or what, at whatever time. Like they're actually, I'm going to link the video. I'm, I hope that you guys watch. It's a long ass video. I hope you guys watch it. I watched uh, about half of it and I'm going to watch the rest of it. But I got the general gist of it. Um, and I guess I'll just a address Proudhon's commentary about the video that he, uh, he thinks something is up because it seemed, you know, highly unnatural that the House of Commons would be going, yay, Extinction Rebellion. Like, we really appreciate you guys for being out here raising awareness. And yay, Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg was is in the House of Commons, like, hanging out. Um, okay, maybe that is weird. <clears throat> or maybe, <clears throat> maybe the pimp people of England are just, are waking up. It's kind of like from here, from my view in Los Angeles, California, United States, you know, <clears throat> from, from over here, I see that the people of the, of the UK, of the United Kingdom are, are waking up and not just, you know, because they're having a debate in the house of commons, but by God, I mean, we have effing climate deniers in, you know, in our uh, uh, in our in our bill, you know, in our government, you know, on the floor of our government, there, you know, we have climate deniers, you know, debating people who actually have studied this for years and years, and they're they're just stupid as shit, and they're like, "What do you mean?" I mean, we have people, you know, carrying glasses of ice water into, you know, um, into the house, talking about we're, you know, into into you know, Senate hearings or whatever, trying to prove that global warming is fake. I mean, that's where we're at. That's where the United States is at. We're so knuckle draggingly backwards, but you, the, you know, the UK are actually not, no people in this debate were like, <clears throat> this is a hoax and it's not real. No, they're all like, so let's do a real, let's actually do a real study with real data and let's get some real data. Can we do that? And let's see if this is even possible. And one, one member of the house of commons actually said something about we need to start talking about growth or whatever not being tied to GDP and I was it was like mind blow I think this is I think it's freaking awesome I you know I don't know if something's up or if there's a you know scheme in the works I, I don't know but you know what that's the hope isn't it that's the 
I mean, that's what people are fighting for, isn't it? For people to have honest discussions about what the actual problem is and what the actual solutions might look like. That's what we're trying to do. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's all a big scheme, scheme or not, but like, I don't care. I don't care because we need to have the conversations like people in power need to be having these, you know, conversations. The media needs to be having these conversations. I'm going to link another extinction rebellion video, uh, where a representative of extinction rebellion is talking on, you know, on the news. So they're having newscasts. They're having newscasts with extinction rebellion people saying, look, here's the problem. Look at the, can you imagine that happening in the United States? I mean, they're busy slandering and calling, you know, people talking about a green new deal lunatics. They can't even they can't even take in the information seriously. They can't even have a, a, a just a baseline discussion of like, well, okay, so we're really screwed and we need to get to 20, you know, net zero by 2025. How do we do it? That's exactly what they're doing in the UK. Bravo. Bravo. You know, it's, you know, I don't know. I don't know if this is all a, you know, a nefarious plot or what, but it's working, right? The people of the United Kingdom are waking up. Why do I know this? Because the Extinction Rebellion is growing by leaps and bounds because you have Just Have a Think, you know, with 10,000 subscribers already. He's doing great work. Uh, it just looks like people there, this whole thing, this whole awareness is like, whoop, it's, it's, it's coming together. It's coming into its own. It's, it's coming out, it's spilling over all over everything. And there's no, you know, there's nothing anybody can do to stop it there over there here. Uh, you know, people are like, what, what? Extinction. What are you guys talking about? Like we're 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 fucked. We're fucked in the United States. We we can't even have an honest discussion. Like people are so clueless. People here are still like, we got to make a lot of money and buy a fucking new SUV or maybe a new Tesla, and we gotta you know, just more 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 money, more status, more power. Maybe we can I don't you know like let's more tech, more tech startups. Come on, guys. We, I don't see anybody having honest discussions about this, like in the media or in the government. We can't even do that. We're so idiotically behind. It's horrible. But maybe, just maybe, we can elect somebody who has, you know, <laughs> um, way more sanity than anybody else in, in our government right now. Somebody like Bernie Sanders. Who can, who can usher in, you know, and he can bring together all the people that are like, uh-huh, uh-huh, this is, yeah, we know about this. He can bring those people together and they can have an honest discussion in our, in the United States government about what the fuck we're going to do. That's the goal, yo. Y'all. Uh, just, you know, again, get out of the way. Get the fuck out of the way and get your conspiracy theories the fuck out of the way. Get the fuck out of the way. Let it happen. Let people talk about this. Let people bring it up. Let people get excited. Let people get enthused. Let people do something about it. I'm down I'm down to hear the conspiracy theories. I'm down to talk about it. I'm down to con discuss, et cetera, et cetera. But don't, you know, don't kill the joy, the momentum. Don't kill the... The wellspring of hope. Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm, 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 I'm getting very, very tired of it. I'm getting very tired of it. Like to the point of, of being like, shut the fuck up with that shit. With that like, oh, we're fucked. Fuck it. Fuck it. It's all a big conspiracy. Fuck it. I'm fucking getting tired of that. So don't, you know, if you want to think that, awesome. But don't fucking get in the way of people who are trying to do something about this or to raise awareness about this or to have, you know, for this to go beyond the doomer level of YouTube, you know, little 2,000, you know, not even 2,000 subscriber me or 5,000 subscriber handbone. Let it be bigger than that instead of just like, 
you know, we got to keep it, we got to keep it doom. We got to keep it all, you know, little and crazy and nobody knows what we're talking about. I mean, it's, 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 it's actually too late for that. There's, it's too, the cat's out of the bag. It's too big. It's too, now people are talking about it. You have the, you, the UK government talking about this. How are you going to keep this from spreading globally, from the awareness spreading globally? You're, you're not even going to keep it out of the United States. I mean, we're just slow to get there. Anyways, big old long, long rant. That's my thoughts on it. Um, I'm willing to, you know, I, I love to have discussions on it. But I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say, like, just stop, stop with the whole. We can't. It's, it sounds really defeatist and just really and almost like cowardly like we can't fight these forces it's too late it's too much it's too big strap it on and fucking do something about it bro um and i know that people are here doing something about it i know that there are people on this channel doing something about it i applaud you Here's the thing that I was going to talk about yesterday and I didn't have time to talk about yesterday. This is from the Brussels Times. Uh, Brussels Times. And this should make you cry or laugh or laugh and cry at the same time. Electric vehicles emit more CO2 than diesel ones, German study shows. Electric vehicles in Germany account for more CO2 emissions than diesel ones, according to a study by German scientists. When CO2 emissions linked to the production of batteries and the German energy mix in which coal still plays an important role are taken into consideration, electric vehicles emit 11% to 28% more than their diesel counterparts, according to the study presented on Wednesday at the IFO Institute in Munich. Mining and processing the lithium, cobalt, and manganese, manganese used for batteries consume a great deal of energy. A Tesla Model 3 battery, for example, represents between 11 and 15 tons of CO2. Given a lifetime of 10 years and an annual travel distance of 15,000 kilometers, this translates into 73 to 98 grams of CO2 per kilometer. Scientist Christer, uh, Christoph Bukal, Hans Dieter Karl, and Hans Werner Sinn, they're not German. They're German, if you can't guess. Noted in their study, the CO2 given off to produce the electricity that powers such vehicles also needs to be factored in, they said. Uh, when all these factors are considered, each Tesla emits 156 to 180 grams of CO2 per kilometer, which is more than a comparable diesel vehicle produced by the German company Mercedes, for example. The German researchers, therefore, take issue with the fact that European officials view electric vehicles as zero-emission ones. They note further that the EU target of 59 grams of CO2 per kilometer by 2030 corresponds to a technically unreal unrealistic consumption of 2.2 liters of diesel or 2.6 liters of gas per 100 kilometers. These new limits pressure German and other European car manufacturers into switching massively to electric vehicles, whereas the researchers feel it would have been preferable to opt for methane engines, whose emissions are one-third less than those of diesel motors. <clears throat> but this is good. They're doing studies on this. They're, we're getting feedback on this. We need to consider whether electric car, you know, producing a bunch of electric cars, obviously is not the answer to lowering our CO2 emissions. Maybe something else. Here's a report from Grist. This is from April 17th, 2019. Report, going 100% renewable power means a lot of dirty mining. For more than a decade, indigenous communities in Alaska have been fighting to prevent the mining of copper and gold at Pebble Mine in Bristol Bay, home to the world's largest sockeye salmon fishery and crucial source of sustenance. The proposed mine, blocked under the Obama administration but inching forward under the Trump administration, has been billed by proponents as necessary to meet the growing demand for copper, 
which is used in wind turbines, batteries, and solar panels. Similar stories are playing out in Norway, where the Sami community is fighting a copper mine. I guess that's an indigenous community in Norway. And in Pap- uh, Papua New Guinea, where a company is proposing mining the seabed for gold and copper. Weighing those trade-offs between supporting mining in environmentally sensitive areas and sourcing metals needed to power renewables is likely to become more common if countries continue generating more renewable energy. That's according to a report out Wednesday from researchers at the Institute for Sustainable Futures at the University of Technology, uh, Technology, Sydney in Australia. The report, commissioned by the environmental organization Earthworks, finds that demand for metals such as copper, lithium, and cobalt would skyrocket skyrocket if countries around the world tried to get their electric grids and transportation systems fully powered by renewable energy by 2050. Consequently, a rush to meet that demand could lead to more mining in countries with lax environmental and safety regulations and weak protection for workers. If not managed responsibly, and it's not being managed responsibly, this has the potential for new adverse environmental and social impacts, the report says. The list of metals used in the production of renewable energy is long. It includes the well-known copper, silver, and aluminum, as well as rare earths such as uh, neo di- uh, neodymium and dispro- pr- dysprosium, used to make magnets for wind turbines. Mining for these metals is currently concentrated in just a handful of countries, Democratic Republic of Congo, China, Chile, and India among them. Take cobalt. Each electric vehicle vehicle needs between 5 to 10 kilograms of the bluish-white metal for its lithium-ion batteries. The authors consider cobalt a metal of concern for supply risks because nearly 60% of its production takes place in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a country with a dismal record of child labor and human rights abuses. Should the world's transportation and electricity sectors ever switch to running entirely on renewables, demand for the metal would soar to more than four times the amount available in reserves, according to researchers. The report's authors modeled one scenario in which they assumed 100% renewable energy use for the electricity production and transportation, a key goal in keeping temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels, and no recycling of metals. In this case, they projected that demand for lithium and nickel would increase 280% and 136% respectively. In another scenario, the researchers assumed a higher rate of recycling and more efficient renewable technologies that require less metal. Demand for the two metals still surpassed existing reserves by 86% and 43%. Payal Sampat, the mining director at Earthworks, said recycling and technological innovation could go a long way toward reducing the demand for rare metals, but cautioned that still more needs to be done. We're not going to tech fix our way out of this. She said it's going to require more meaningful policy changes that fundamentally reduce the overall demand. And there you go. Reduce degrowth, 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 reducing consumption, reducing energy use, reducing, you know, food demand, etc. All of those things. This has to be said over and over and over and over again so that, you know, it gets to all the people that are starting, you know, to the governments and the politicians and the activists and the people that are talking about where, where do we go? How do we do this? How do we figure this out? You know, because we have so little time, this much time, we have this much time. How, you know, how we do this is imp- very important. It has to be discussed. <clears throat> Um, moving on lastly, I I think being skeptical and having concerns is, is appropriate. It's appropriate, but we, the discussion is the important part, you know, moving through it like, no, okay, that's not going to work. What else can we do? Where else do we go? How, how do we deal with this? You know, eventually the discussion, if, you know, the discussion here gets into the Senate or the House of Representatives, you know, if we get past the even like, oh, well, yeah, 2025, net zero, you know, then what do we do about global dimming? What do we do about <laughs> the already, already melted Arctic ice cap? What do we do about all that? Um, 
you know, we most likely will die trying, but that's, you know, try we must, as the great philosopher Yoda said. Or did he say something else? <laughs> there is no try, only do. I think I remember that. Uh, this is from Robert Hunsaker. I was going to read this yesterday, and now I'm reading it now. Now is now. The Blue Ocean Event and Collapsing Ecosystems, April 19th, 2019. And so this is the reality of where we are at. Sometime in the near future, it is highly probable for the Arctic that the Arctic will have, no longer have sea ice, meaning zero ice for the first time in eons, a.k.a. the Blue Ocean Event. Surely the world is not prepared for the consequences of such an historic event, which likely turns the world topsy-turvy, negatively impacting agriculture with gonzo weather patterns, thus forcing people to either starve or fight. But the problem may be even bigger than shortages of food, as shall be discussed. Still, in all, it's somewhat consoling to know that the Blue Ocean event is quite controversial within the scientific community. There are climate scientists that believe Arctic ice will be there beyond this century. <laughs> scientists? These are scientists. One can only hope they are right, because an ice-free Arctic will indubitably create havoc for life on the planet. However, disturbingly, the prospects for enduring sea ice don't look good. Here's why. Dr. Peter Wadhams, Professor Emeritus, University of Cambridge, who's le the leading authority of Arctic sea ice and farewell to ice, Oxford University Press, was recently interviewed regarding the current status of the Arctic sea ice as of 2019 and recorded on TUC Radio, uh, broadcast on KALW San Francisco, uh, and other independent internet radio. Here are snippets from that interview. Over the past 40 years, the loss of Arctic sea ice has rapidly progressed. Uh, E.g. from 1976 to 87, Arctic sea ice thickness decreased by 15%. During the 90s, thickness decreased by 43%. And today, 75% of the sea ice is gone, resulting in an impairment of sea ice albedo, which reflects solar radiation back into outer space by 80 to 90% with sea ice. But conversely, without sea ice, it absorbs 80 to 90% of solar radiation into the dark background of iceless water where crucial, untold dangers lurk. Accordingly, the Arctic has experienced the biggest transition of albedo on the planet. The consequences are unimaginably challenging, kind of like trying to calculate beforehand what happens when fallen into an ontological rabbit hole, or in other words, expect the unexpected. Not only that, but the Arctic is already a hot house in the, hot, in the hemisphere. For example, permafrost samples in the Yukon near Dempster Highway registered temps as of April 2019 nearly 2C higher than at any point in time over the past 10,000 years. As far as that goes, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change suggests an upper limit or guardrail of 2C post-industrial temperature if exceeded Primary ecosystems that support life are at risk of breaking down. In fact, aside from the Arctic, pivotal ecosystems are already starting to break down around the world, especially in the rainforests of Puerto Rico and Mexico. Experiencing high temperature variations of 2C, where shockingly, anthropods are disappearing nearly en masse. As well as documentation of over 100 separate locations, flying insect Armageddon in Europe likely caused by toxic chemicals, registering mass losses of 75% over a few decades, which characterizes an extinction event. As for the Arctic sea ice scenario, one critical question is not discussed in public. What happens next? What happens when all the sea ice is gone? According to the tenacious climate scientist Paul Beckwith, the refrigerator effect is lost in the blue ocean event, meaning that water temperature is not pegged close to the freezing point when there is no ice left to melt. Thereafter, by default, the only major source of ice remaining in the Northern Hemisphere will be Greenland. There, thenceforth, the center of cold in the northern, hem northern Hemisphere will shift to Greenland, no longer the Arctic, likely shifting from the North Pole to approximately 73 degrees north latitude or the center of Greenland, Beckwith. Then what? <clears throat> Unfortunately, that creates a whole new category of risks as weather patterns throughout the Northern Hemisphere depend upon jet streams. Uh, 20,000 to 39,000 feet above sea level that rely upon the center of cold over the North Pole interceding with warm air currents from the tropics to generate jet stream gusto. If the center of cold shifts, who knows for sure what will happen to the crucial jet streams? We already know what's happening to them right now. 
The short answer may be that jet streams will go bonkers, more so than ever before. Of course, to a lesser degree, this is already happening right now and causing extreme weather events like massive flooding in the Midwest. Hello, Kansas. As of 2019, all-time record-setting heavy weather hit the U.S. with humongous amounts of snow throughout the northern Midwest as a result of snow move, slow-moving, wobbly jet streams that loop and bring Arctic weather directly south. Believe it or not, the resultant massive flooding, also record-setting, may be a minor event in the context in the context of newly released chilling study about the impact of Arctic sea ice loss. As follows. The study of ancient ice cores by a team from the British Antarctic Survey, University of Cambridge, and University of Birmingham found a major reduction in sea ice in the Arctic cranked up temperature amplification as a result of no Arctic sea ice. Greenland regional temperatures by 16 C in less than a decade. Massive. According to the study, this work confirms the significance of sea ice for past abrupt warming events. This is important because changes in sea ice have profound consequences on both global and local scales, including impacts on global climate, global climate and local ecosystems. Significantly, if the impact of abrupt sea ice loss in Greenland uh, scenario on Greenland scenario were to recur, it would create havoc and panic within a decade. Could it happen? Well, it happened in the past without the assistance of human-influenced GHG emissions. Therefore, the answer seems to be yes. It could happen again. End of story. Or you might want to just go all the way to will. But on second thought, the 16C increase in temps is less in less than a decade is difficult to fathom, even though the paleoclimate record shows it did happen. After rereading the British Antarctic study again and again, it goes without saying that a temperature increase of 16 C within a decade would destroy most life. How about a 4 C temperature increase would most likely bring us to extinction? One can only hope that the British Antarctic Survey team made a big fat mistake or there are extenuating circumstances of some kind or other. But make no mistake about this, greenhouse gas emissions today are rip-snorting faster than it almost any paleoclimate timescale, likely setting a new 62-year record for CO2 emissions in 2019. Precariously, that feeds directly into increased planetary heat and loss of more Arctic sea ice. The end result cannot be good, an understatement. According to NASA Global Climate Change, Vita, Vita signs of the planet, ice cores drawn from Greenland, Antarctica, and tropical mountain glaciers show that the Earth's climate responds to changes in greenhouse gas levels. Ancient evidence also can be found in tree rings, ocean sediments, coral reefs, layers of sedimentary rock. This ancient or paleoclimate evidence reveals that current warming is occurring roughly 10 times faster than the average rate of ice age recovery warming. Meanwhile, according to the aforementioned interview with Dr. Peter Wadhams, currently the Arctic is heating up about four times faster than the rest of the planet. The temp difference between the Arctic and the tropics is dropping precipitously, thus driving jet streams less, creating meandering jet streams, in turn producing extreme weather events throughout the northern hemisphere, especially in mid-latitudes where most of the world's food is grown. Not only is future food production seriously at risk, but as well, massive quantities of buried seabed methane, Hello, methane, my old friend, much more powerful in its initial years at influencing global warming than CO2. And the Arctic could release suddenly because of loss of albedo, no longer reflecting solar radiation into space, rather absorbing it down to massive quantities of CH4 under seabed permafrost, which is the greatest single threat we face. It could be a catastrophe because the temperature would suddenly rise and it wouldn't rise smoothly, says Wadhams. But really, honestly, come on now. Something's got to hopefully be wrong with the aforementioned British Antarctic Survey scientific data. Could it be misplaced decimal point? Astonishingly, astonishingly it is factual data. In the simplest of terms, Greenland's 16 C temperature increase in less than a decade is mind-blowing, especially in consideration of the survey's teams, survey team statement that it confirms the significance of sea ice for past abrupt warming events. Hmm. Deja vu. The Arctic sea ice scenario today seems curiously similar to the British Antarctic study. Prospectively, that's really horrible news. Um, and it is. And uh, 
you know, we'll see, we'll see if we have any time between the, the moment when humanity itself wakes up to the, this knowledge. Oh, ship's going down. Um, and we have any time to write the ship. Um, that is the uh, million, nay, billion, nay, trillion dollar question um, if we're going to do that in time. But um, we're not going to do that until we start talking about it, until people start talking about it en masse, until it's become something that is talked about on Fox News, <laughs> you know, not stupidly either, like, you know, factually. On CNN, on MSNBC, um, on every news station on the planet, it has to be talked about factually. Um, we'll see if we get to that point whether that will do anything to drive us in the in some direction in which we can actually write our course. Um, I have no idea about that. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for your eyes, your ears, and your conscience. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so at the links below. Until next time. Peace.